I don't know if France was prepared. An overwhelming tide of orange approaches from the northeast. Also, there was very little warning because wooden shoes are a lot quieter than you think. That's right, Le Mans is being invaded by the Dutch today. As we get ready to watch the gathering of tweakers, Le Mans 195 Porsche Super Cup, and you'll see it all live here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. Hi, I'm Joe Peek, and with me in the booth is Joseph Ringrose. Behind the scenes is our director, the Dr. Amjad Yaman, and he's using cameras provided by Ducky Beard. Joseph, I know those of you over in the UK are also pretty fond of this French circuit, so why don't you tell us about them all? Yep, we are indeed very, very fond of this circuit, home to the most famous motor race in the world, the 24 Hours of Le Mans, featuring 33 turns of the most iconic corners in motorsport around the eight and a half mile circuit it is one of the most recognizable names in racing we're going to be having 23 laps today or two hours depending on the course of the race as i said 33 turns 8.47 miles and for you guys who run in kilometers 13.63 of those and of course as always the best way to find our way around a new track is to get on board the GSRC Porsche for our lap guide. All right, we're in the GSRC Porsche, so let's do a lap around them all. You'll notice how the stands and buildings towering on either side can be a little intimidating, but you don't want to get distracted. 
The Dunlop Curve needs a lot of focus since you're going to be turning and braking for the Dunlop Chicane as you navigate it. Try to hold the car off to the right instead of tracking out. And then be wary of the sausage curves at the apexes because you can damage the car if you clatter over them too hard. Up and under the Dunlop Bridge, you've now hit the Chapel Rundown. You need a big lift to keep the car held off to the right and to give yourself a better line through the Forest S's. Really try to use the banking here to help carry your speed, but be careful as you exit the right-hander. The crest can sometimes make the car get light. Then comes one of the most critical corners of the track, Turt Rouge. Hesitate on the power and you'll be losing time all the way down to the first chicane. Go in too hard and you could suffer a slowdown penalty, which will hurt worse. But we're going to skip ahead to the Forza chicane. It's wise to maybe brake just a hair early to ensure you don't overshoot the corner. Just like before, with the car returning to the Molson straight, getting confidently onto the gas is important. But these straights are long enough that your opponents might be able to use the slipstream to make an attack. Next is the Michelin chicane. It's the same deal as the first chicane, but mirrored. Instead of a right, left, right, you're now going left, right, left. The car's going to get wound up yet again, but now we come to the Molson corner. Ever since they added the roundabout here, the nasty kink of the braking zone really challenges your skills and bravery. That doesn't mean drivers won't have a go at making a pass here, though. The gravel trap on the outside is obviously better than hitting a wall, but it'll also cost you gobs of time. After you fly past Golf and No Name, you hit Indianapolis. This is another place where you're braking and turning at the same time, so stability in your setup will be key. The banking lets you carry speed out of the corner better than you'd expect, but you quickly need to switch sides for Arnage. This is one of the slowest turns on the track, and that outside barrier comes up very fast, so watch out. After your last long flat-out stretch, the final portion of the circuit is the Porsche Curves. Expect to be mostly single file through this area unless someone makes a major mistake. These S's will gradually tighten with every bend, though they're each unique. Bridge is especially precarious with that big blue wall right at the edge of the track. And karting really fools you into taking more speed into it than is wise. It's best to keep hugging that right side because the final left-hander offers up a nasty slowdown penalty if you swing out too wide into the paved runoff. From there, Maison Blanche is flat out and you'll need to spot your brake marker for the Ford Chicane. The Porsche needs an unexpectedly long braking zone, especially with how fast this first part is. But the second tighter part has some tall curbs that the car takes surprisingly well, so don't be afraid to get aggressive. From there, hopefully you've kept it all together and have now finished a lap around them all. That Porsche, definitely one of the more popular cars on the iRacing service. Of course, apologies, uh, we're having a couple technical difficulties and we're going to get picture back to you soon here in the final stages of qualifying. But before we do that, Joseph, this is a long track, really known for its high speed. So I have to imagine there's got to be some places where there's good spots to overtake. Yeah, uh, with a long circuit comes many corners, comes many passing zones. Uh, starting off with the first passing zone on track, we have the infamous Dunlop chicane, sort of just after the pit exit. Um, if you get a good run out of the final corner, out of the final chicane, you could definitely have a run into there and make a possible move. And then we have the big, big straight of the Molzan, featuring two chicanes, both really, really good passing opportunities. Uh, slipstream and the draft will be a big factor today uh, on drivers making moves so we will 100% see moves there especially on the first lap uh, 60 odd cars round Le Mans all in the same car we will see some draft overtakes we have Indianapolis of course and Ford Ford will be a very very good passing opportunity a lot of chicanes around here they almost by necessity had to slow things down a little bit in modern times uh, in this track. It has evolved so much over the years. As we get our pictures back now, we see just about nine minutes left on our qualifying. This is open so that it can still change as we get down to the dying stages of that. Drivers continue to try to get their fast laps in. Real quick, let's introduce our viewers to this one-off race and get them up to speed on what to expect today. This is in the 911 GT3 Cup version of the Porsche. Obviously, we're finally going to get a, a second Porsche, the uh, the, LM, uh, the LMP1 version of the Porsche uh, a little bit later in, in the next build. Now, the race distance today is 23 laps. And I'm sure a lot of people are going, why not 24? I mean, it's the 24 hours of Le Mans circuit. 
Well, uh, it comes out to almost exactly a half hour, and that is 194 miles that they're going to be racing out there for those 23 laps. It is open setup, and in this car, that does make a difference. Drivers will be tweaking away to try to find those last few tents. They do, thankfully, with it being a long race, Joseph, have one fast repair. And I have a feeling a few drivers are going to need that. It is a standing start today. I don't think I've ever seen a standing start on a uh, on Le Mans with this many cars. So I'm kind of curious how it's going to go and how far through the chicane they're going to be backed up when they get the green. Yeah, you're going to have 60 cars all fighting. I mean, I'm sure we'll see a couple of incidents here and there into Dunlop, etc. But 60 cars going into the first chicane. And then you have the second chicane. We'll probably get an incident in the turn one. Yeah, the first chicane. Uh, some, move some moves, of course. And I mean, it, we'll just have to wait and see how it pans out, especially with the standing start. Really mixes things up. Probably a first for a lot of the drivers having a standing start race around this circuit. We're used to having a rolling start, of course. Let's be right on board with Christian Skublian. Uh, gets another of his laps in, currently sitting in seventh. Uh, as we said, the order isn't going to mean a whole lot, uh, especially with the draft, but you really don't want to be at the back of the pack because that is going to be almost impossible to climb your way to the front unless you are phenomenally good to pass 60 cars out there today. There is a long race, so as you would expect, the drivers will have to take pit stops, and pit strategy is going to be important today. Now, I saw some debate among drivers, uh, but I never really saw a consensus, Joseph, on whether it is one or two stops. And I get the feeling that this is a really difficult track with its length to try and and, and cut it close on fuel because you're not exactly going to coast around. Yeah, it's one of those circuits like the Nordlife. Life. If you can't really cut it short, you can't try and say lift on coast on my lap if you're, you've got say 0.1 litres uh, left and you're able to run that uh, you believe you're going to be able to survive and because of the nature of the circuit it's very high speed you're at very high revs down that back straight down the Molzan people will struggle with fuel so you've got to play it safe um, sometimes the risk is worth taking around some tracks we look at some shorter tracks like Brands Hatch and them kind of tracks but this is completely different Riding on board with David Haynes right now, heading down that Molson straight out of the Forza chicane. And really, as we ride on board, you get a feel, well, now as we jump off there, but I get a feel for, for how high the revs will get in these cars. I actually, I don't know about you, but it, when I was doing the lap guide, I was hitting the rev limiter at the end of some of these straights because you can't change the gearing on this car. Yeah, the gearing is fixed, so you can't change that. and. These drivers will be hitting the rev limiter uh, at the end of going into each chicane. So these drivers are going to have, well, yeah, it's going to be difficult for them to gain that point with not being able to shift up, etc. But yeah, we'll have to wait and see how it pans out. Yeah, I guess I guess if you're going to make the move, you got to make the momentum work early because you'll just run out of steam. You'll kind of be deadlocked come the, <laughs> come, come the end of the straights. David Barenclaw coming from the UK and I. I did mention that, you know, that it was the Dutch invading as the gathering of tweakers known for their heavy Dutch contingency, but obviously a lot of drivers from all over. There's one of our Benelux drivers, Marco Derricks, coming uh, in uh, onto the Molson straight off of one of those oh so important corners, that Turtle Rouge that dumps you really what I, I think what I found is the longest uh, of the stretches here on the Molson. Jump over to Vim Stockmans, another of our Benelux drivers coming in. Try and uh, include the Sea of Orange. Just four minutes left to go. Right now, the top of the order is Sindra Setsas, currently with a four flat point nine. Incredible lap around there. In fact, the only driver to get below a 401. He's got an entire second over Tom Jansen, which and normally we keep talking about this, and I feel like uh, we can't harp on it enough. Uh, Joseph, normal tracks that would be just a, an incredible amount of time, but here it's both so long, the draft so uh, important that I don't think it's going to be as catastrophic as, as you would think elsewhere for Tom to be a second behind. 
Yeah, if you look at other races um, at, around different circuits, around you know, there's a sort of conventional length circuits. It's you know, a second is a long, long time. As we were talking about Brands Hatch tracks like that, with just over a minute lap time in a lot of cars, that is a so such a big amount of time that you're losing. But around this track, it's four minutes, four minutes, and that's one second. You're losing a second a lap around a four minute circuit. That's not too bad if you look at it, and you probably think, oh, Sindre's, you know, way ahead of everyone else. But it's a factor as well. We've got to factor in that it's an open session, so there will be drafting involved. Well, that's very true, and we haven't mentioned that yet, with the uh, drivers being able to maybe utilize one another, get a little bit tricky here in qualifying to find that extra bit of time. That may be what Syndra has done. Oh, and Jeremy Ravon moves himself up in a second. Mika Eschhaus as well gets into third ahead of Tom Jansen. Bumps it a lot closer. Jeremy is now at a 401.2. And he's going to get one more lap, I believe, to try and go faster. So we're down to two and a half minutes to go, and they will get some time at the end of the qualifying session to put a hot lap in. Oh, new fast lap from Sindre. And that is a 409.17, four flat 917 there. So just barely less than a tenth faster, even over that four miles of track. Eight, or wait, is it eight miles of track? I'm, I lost my notes on that. Regardless, a four-minute four minute lap, I should say. Uh, just that tiny, tiny little improvement as we look at Tim Clayson sitting down in six right now, coming down the Molson straight, sitting at a 4.021. The gap between first and the last time right now, Andrew Fawcett sitting in 58th, is a 4.09.5. So about almost uh, eight seconds, almost nine seconds gap between there now thankfully with it being such a long lap traffic shouldn't come into play until pretty late except uh, cars who have serious problems now i'm looking through and i see a few drivers sitting in the pits waiting for the uh session to end as they go through their their uh, setups probably and just tweak the last few final things the pit entry we can't forget the pit entry joseph that that tricky double chicane that they have in there. I've driven here and it's caught me out uh, in endurance races that uh, I've screwed up that pit entry. Yeah, we have 50, well, 60 drivers here today and I'm sure at least one of them will make a mistake. Going into that pit lane, a double chicane, it's not easy, especially with the nature of this car. You have to be really, really good on the brakes. Otherwise, the rear end gets a bit tail happy, so they'll have to navigate their way through those two chicanes but if they're managing to find their way through the other chicanes hopefully they can get their way into those yeah and we haven't mentioned this is a rear engine car the porsche kind of known for that does that do anything in particular on the handling that it really sets it apart since it's not a typical engine setup uh, compared to other cars on the iRacing service yeah i mean Especially on the brakes, I feel it has the biggest dis uh, difference to a lot of the other cars, mid-engine, front, en front engine, the majority of the cars on the service. Um, so when you're on the brakes, you have to be, you know, nice and gentle with it, not too, ag not overly aggressive, so to speak. Otherwise, the rear end, as I said, will get a bit tail happy and you don't want that because that will be a spin and it's not really all that easy to hold it. Checkered flag is out. I'm seeing who else is still on a hot lap. I see is Sindre sets us. I don't think he was able to get out on a hot lap. So I'm not, I think this is just a warm up lap for him. So I don't think his is going to count. Casper de Court, I believe, is going to be the last one to cross the line, if I'm reading this correctly. Right now, Marco, Mark Oros coming through the Porsche curves. He sits in the. Where is he actually? He is down in 49th, well down the order. So he really wants to try and make this a good lap as he comes out of karting through Maison Blanche. All the French speakers out there will have to forgive my poor French pronunciations. I took German, so I kind of passed on, on the romantic language. Now through the Ford chicane. 
up and over those tall sausage curves at the end. Does he improve his time? It's a 4.071. As he crosses, he does not. He's going to do no better than 49th. Danny Weller going to be the next one to cross the line. Den uh, Denny Weller, excuse me. Coming from Diatch. Oh, and he was way over that first half of the Ford chicane. I'm not sure if this is going to count for him. He's right now sitting in 35th at a 405.2. Oh, but it does count. Wow. Got, gets himself up to 32nd with a 4047. That should be it for our qualifying. Let's go through our starting grid. A whole lot of cars to get through here. Sindrina sets us on the pole out of 60 cars. Jeremy Ravon will be on the front row with him on this standing start. Mika Eshaus in row two in third. Then Tim Clayson's next to him starting fourth. Tom Jansen will be fifth. Marcel Fassbender in P6 today. Then you get back to Simon Grossman in seventh. Christian Skumlian in eighth. P9 goes to Dennis Garrison. And Leif Vengenachin starts in the top 10 position. Joseph? The first man outside the top 10 will be Michael Mitner, followed by joining him on the sixth row of the grid, which will be Cedric Bolen. Casper de Court lines up in P13, followed by Tor Anders Bevan. Then we have Richard Dennis the second with Chris Fuller two uh, lined up alongside David B Baraclo and Bass Slob, and riding right that the top twenty is Bob Van Catwick and David Haynes. Coming back to the blackjack spot, we have Marco Derricks and then Vim Stockmans starting twenty second. Stefan Overgaard will be in 23rd, old-time favorite here on GSRC, the Flying Smurf. Wilhelm Vilberg will be next to him in 24th. Row 13, Lars Moldenauer and Rowan Gill in 26th. Adam Parle will be in 27th position with Martin uh, Hilligers starting in 28th. Then you go back to row 15. P29 will be Darren Seal. Rounding out the top 30 is Ben Cupers. Tiemann Nabuz. Excuse my pronunciation. Lines up in P31 with Denny Weller up in P32. Jason Marshall in 33rd with Juice de Vries lining up alongside. Martin Verslevuen, uh, P35 with Anders Christensen next up. David Bod Daniel Bodner is P37 in the 11 car. And in the 51 it is Newt Molog. Nenad uh, Ulip is P39 and Robert de Rouge Lines up in 40th. Brood Mulders is going to be in 41st. Hampus Baz starting in 42nd and 43rd. Hans Haspertoven. Bjorn de Forsch starts 44th. We saw him yesterday, I believe, or actually maybe it was uh, on Friday. These broadcasts start to stream together after a while. Victor Dravegard will be 45th in row 23, followed by Frank Oosterhaus. Jay Yonkers will be 47th with Kim Cook. Starting in 48th, and Mark Oros, who we watched finish his qualifying lap in 49th. Then in 50th, you get Christian Arp. Rene Weller, the second of the Wellers, is 51st. Rich Nortland follows him. The 312 car is Charlie Fruhuith with Patrick Post in 54th. Eric Nannings in 55th, and the 47 of Kip Stevens just behind him. 57, Frank Lehman, and the last driver to set a time is Andrew Fawcett. Two drivers not to set a time in that session, Rick Tacroni and David Ahoog. Well, that is your starting order. I thought we needed a little bit more time for that, but still have 30 seconds left on our qualifying session. So we watch Mark Oros come to a halt there on the front stretch. It's going to be difficult because there's a lot of names that we don't know as well, but there are some familiar fast ones in here, Joseph. So my traditional question to my co, as always, who's your pick for today? Who do you think is going to come away top out of 60 cars? Well, I mean, looking at the pace shown, I think Sindre has to be up there. Uh, a lot of the guys, he's a very well-known guy in the community. Uh, Jeremy Ravon showing he's got the pace in qualifying. Uh Marcel Fassbender is another one um, that I recognise and I know is very fast. 
but I'm going to say Sindre for this one. All right, taking the safe bet as the cars start to line up on the grid. And here we will finally get to see just, oh my gosh, some of these drivers really are going through the chicane as we now get the uh, the flyover. There we see the beautiful Fleur de Lis, or tricolor, I should say. Fleur de Lis is the symbol really, for France is known for. Wonderful flyby of those French jets going past the 24 hour of Le Mans sign, Michelin sign. Famous now on the front stretch. Boy, I would not want to be one of these drivers stuck right in the middle of the chicane at, at the drop of the green here, Joseph. Definitely not. If you're in the middle of the pack, oh God, it's going to be an interesting one for you, isn't it? If a car goes round, he's bound to collect at least one or two cars really at the top of that hill it's blind going up there so i mean sinjay is obviously in the best position you don't really want any cars in front of you um it's being at the back i mean being at the back could be seen as a positive as you just could sort of lift off at the start but you will lose time to the guys ahead but you could avoid incidents from that way they go all the way back to the pit entry out there through the cars lining up on the grid this is why i mentioned that it's not just a matter of wanting a good uh, position to try and uh you know be ahead of the mess but it's it's lengthwise you're not just trying to get past cars there's uh cars uh, in the way well anyways we've got the lights up green flag is out we're off for 23 laps around the circuit of le mans Sindras with a great start as Ravon tries to follow and cut off the car of Tim Clayson's almost coming together with him as they come through the Dunlop corner. Now they break for the first time into the Dunlop chicane. Some three wide a little bit farther back. How are they going to cycle through this very slow corner? I'm not seeing any issues so far, Joseph. Have you caught anything? Not from mine. Seems to be a pretty clean start. I'm pretty shocked that most of the guys got through there, got through there cleanly. And, uh, and Nenad Ulip back down at the very back of the train. Something happened to him and another driver. It looks like they just kind of came together coming through the Dunlop curve. And that is what caused that. As we now hit the Molson straight. Coming up to the Forza chicane for the first time. Slipstream is going to be in force here for these guys. Some of them are going to be looking for a move into the first chicane on the Mozan. Obviously, it says Syndra is in second, but that is incorrect. The toe that Nanad took is what put him up there. Oh, did we get a slowdown? Jeremy Ravage, Ravon, very slow. Did you see what happened, Joseph? Yeah, he just looked to catch a bit of the corner and just went off. And I think he picks up a slowdown. That is going to hurt. That sends him back to fifth currently. And that stretches our leaders apart, which is going to be critical for Sindra. As that means that he could maybe break the draft. We'll know for sure as the race goes on. Accelerating out of the Michelin chicane now. Your order behind him is Clayson's, S-House, and Grossman. It looks like Skublian managed to get past Ravon as well to get into fifth. In fact, those two side by side, you can see it now. Heading up to Molson corner. I would not want to be too wide coming into this breaking zone, Joseph. No, it's a, it's a tricky one, this one. You have sort of the little kink and then you have the corner itself. And he runs out wide, gets into the gravel. And that's going to allow Christian Skublian to get past him. Ravon just seems all out of sorts on this first lap. He got rattled by that mistake, and now he's made a second one. This is going to put Fassbender just behind him, along with a whole string of cars. Garrison and Mittner also giving watch. A little bit of a challenge to the inside by Fassbender as they come up to Indianapolis, another corner where you really don't want to get into a tangle. This is still very early in this hour and a half race. They get single file as they come through Indianapolis, and no incident, thankfully. Yeah, we seem to have had a pretty clean start so far this race. Pretty, 
Ooh, Garrison with a move to the inside there, getting himself up a couple positions. Excuse me, though, that was uh, Michael Mittner who overtook, uh, I believe it was Garrison, actually. Those three still in a line. That is for 8th, 9th, and 10th. Just a little bit up ahead of them. Christian Skumlian in 6, trying to challenge Ravon still. As they come through the Porsche curves for the first time, Gumlian set on the back foot. Now as they hit carding, car behind. I think that was Fastbender blinking slightly. He takes a bit of a peek. He could have a go if he wants it here, Joseph. Goes in there, but thinks better of it. It's an hour and a half race. You want to keep your laps done. Take too many. You're going to sort of treat it like an endurance race. Be hitting cars left, right, and center. So as lap one is now complete, your order as they cross the line. Syndra, Tim Claysons, Mika Ashaus, Simon Grossman, Jeremy Ravon, Christian Skublian, Marcel Fassbender, Michael Mittner, Leif Van Genichen, and Dennis Garrison are your top 10. Watch Claysons giving chase in second place. Only about half a second back at the moment. So very much still in play. Yeah, Syndra isn't going to get the benefit of the slipstream uh, that Tim and Mika are. Mika's going to get it off Tim, and Tim's going to get it off Syndra. So I don't think he's close enough to be able to make a move, but he may lose a bit of time to the guys behind. Four temps currently. We ride on board with S House, or we were riding on board with the Momo of S House. Third in line, he's gaining on Clayson's. What can he do, though, once they get to the first chicane? And he's going to break a little bit early. Not going to challenge here. Wonder, Joseph, if maybe we'll see a few cars doing a little bit of lifting in the draft to try and save that fuel that we were talking about. Yeah, when they get high in the revs, they could just sort of lift off slightly, save a bit of fuel, and that could help them later on in the race when it comes to the pit stops. Maybe be able to go that extra lap. Maybe, as you said, no one's really 100% sure whether this is going to be a one-stop, whether this is going to be a two-stop. So maybe some of those guys can stretch it out just to the one. Whoa! Not sure if that was a move or a mistake from Tim Clayson's, whichever it was. I think he made it work for now. Move Tim Clayson's into the lead. As, as we look at the replay, unfortunately, Sindre is going to come back at him. We'll get to that once we come back live. Woo, great job by Syndra to see that one coming. We come back live. He's already back past him using the slipstream. So the order returns to how it was. Setsas, Clayson, Eschhaus. What do you think, Joseph? Mistake or intentional? I mean, I think he just broke a bit late, saw the opportunity and just took it. I mean, it didn't seem to be a planned move. Maybe a mistake, but it turned to pay off. But Syndra has got that past we got a three wide situation a little bit farther back it's for 13th spot and I think that's split up now down into two Derricks and Slob side by side as they head through no name and then golf corner here up into Indianapolis Derricks thinks better of it and backs out slots in behind now they work their way through Indianapolis I believe both of these Dutchmen. Indeed, both hailing from the Benelux Club out of Arnage, one of the tricky, tricky corners, deceptively tricky through that slow right-hander. And they stream up towards the Porsche curves. I have some news on Christian Skimli, and it seemed to, when he was coming down for the second lap on the Mozan straight, just a bit slow lifted off in that core motorsports car and that was it he just disconnected i don't know exactly know what happened to him look back no incidents just a little for gas so we jump back down to 24th here looking at uh, the battles in the mid pack adam parl trying to hold off rowan grill rowan gill excuse me and danny weller behind them Slowdown penalties, not just for cutting 
the inside of a corner, but the outside, drivers need to be oh so wary in some of these portions there, Joseph. Yeah, it's one of those circuits where some some corners are quite easy to get those slowdown penalties and you don't want to be getting that, especially through the chicane. We saw, who was it that got it earlier? I can't quite Fassbender? remember. I think Fassbender just got one. He was very slow. Yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy Ravon got one as well and it just cost him going down the straight. You're just not going to have that momentum. We're going to try and find Fassbender's incident. This is coming to the Ford chicane. We're riding on board. Gets through the first half fine. Oh, interesting. It must have been... Oh, you know, it might have been before that, but let's uh, just come back live then. Could have been coming out of karting. That's one of those spots where drivers known for getting those slowdowns. If they go too wide instead of too far inside, he's recovered and is in 12th as we jump up to second to look at Clayson still in the midst of that podium fight between Setsas and Eschhaus. Yeah, no, no move just yet. He's going to continue on, stay in that slipstream, see what, see if he can do what he did last lap and maybe hope he can stay ahead this time and not allow Syndra back past. The other thing about these rear engine cars, do these drivers need to worry about the rear tires and, and how much they, they're slipping and sliding or getting on the power too early? Because I would think that all that weight back there would maybe make them heat up a little quicker. Yeah, the weight distribution isn't as sort of, usually we usually see a 50-50 weight distribution, but not in these cars. The, most of the weight is at the back, so that can prove traction to be difficult for some of these guys. It's not an easy car to drive. Um, I know even the top guys find this car difficult to drive. Yeah, it's up there with some of them, but it will affect the rear tyres and it will become even harder when the tyres start to go off and then they'll have to start thinking about pit stops. And in fact, we should mention with this being the cup version of the Porsche, that there are very few gadgets on the car, so they'd have no traction control. Uh, there's no... Uh, anti-lock brakes on this car so you it is all down to the driver no uh, nothing to really save you or hide your your weaknesses as we look back at Mittner in eighth it's in a nice little battle with Garrison and Decourt haven't seen Casper Decourt on the Global Sim Racing Channel in quite a while he actually raced back when we ran a roof series before they got the Porsche here uh, on iRacing so familiar territory for Casper. Yeah, the roof is essentially just a tuned Porsche before the license, so the Porsche became available. So very, very similar car to drive. Coming out of Arnage, drivers trying to get the power down. Nobody able to gain an advantage over the other, although to court looking a little slow behind these two. That's Mittner in the yellow that we're watching. And the white machine ahead of him is Garrison. Not going to be close enough to make an attack as they hit the Porsche curves getting single file. Seems to be some damage to the yellow machine of Mike, Michael Mittner's car. So he may have made contact with one of the guys. Just the hood starting to pop up a bit. Looking back at him from Garrison, trying to take a look and see. Hard to tell with him being this far back, maybe when he breaks into there. Nope, never mind, <laughs> as we jump up to the helicopter cam. Oh, that was definitely a cut course for Decourt, I would think. And there's the confirmation as he pulls off and lets a bunch of cars go on by. That's going to be Barraclaw that gets him, but he minimizes damage. Beautiful job by Decourt to give the time back without losing too much ground. He only loses one position. Yeah, that was that was a good thinking from Casper there, managing just to lose the one uh, position for him. Let's give a little bit of love to the drivers farther back. How about 38th Martin uh, Veslouvain? There's a car behind him actually having him off. That was uh, Mark Oros not having a good day. This fight down the order for 37th. Martin 
doing all he can to try and catch Rene Veller. Takes a little bit of a peek to the inside. Oh, big lockup for Veller. Comes back over, over, under there from Martin. And I think he's going to get the spot. They hit the chapel rundown. Rene could try and fight back into the forest S's. I think he's going to give it his best shot. But it's just not enough as the apex is now going to go to Rene. Or excuse me, to Martin. Interesting to point out, Ton Janssen was one of the top guys in qualifying, starting P5. Not been in the best of days for him. P35 currently 38 seconds back from Sindra. Oof, just a devastating blow from Tom, for Tom Janssen. As we go back up to the leaders, still three together, still have not separated. Going to be hard to peel our eyes away from these guys unless they just do a little bit of formation flying. So your top three, your podium, if you're just joining us here on the Global Sim Racing channel, sets us, leads the way over Tim Clayson's, over Eschhaus. This is a 23-lap race around the Circuit of Le Mans, Circuit de la Sarthe. Whoa! Look to the outside. That definitely looked like more of a mistake to me from Tim Clayson's as he loses second to Mika Eschhaus. Yeah, that was definitely a mistake from Tim there. Probably a lockup would be the most, well, most explainable case. I don't 100% know, but that's probably the most likely case that happened to him. That allowed Mika Eschwies to be able to get up into P2. Yeah, Eschhaus doing a great job just kind of waiting for this race to come to him. Now, in the background, we can kind of see that's Jeremy Ravon and Simon Grossman gaining ground on these three. These two have been working together beautifully. And despite the top three not really battling a whole lot, are pulling them back in. Yep, managing to catch these guys up and turn it into a five car battle uh, soon. Tim not being able, Tim and Mika not being able to find a way past Syndra. Uh, maybe Simon, Jeremy, and get past those guys and battle Singer for the lead. Ravon took a little bit of a look at Grossman, but thought better of it. Simon, not just a fast driver, but also really good with a computer. He is uh, the creator of the software that you're seeing right now uh, for our timing and scoring graphics. ATVO, great stuff. We love that software. So big shout out to Simon for helping us out there. Right now, he's not worried about that. He's worried about what's in his mirrors as Ravon continues to hound him for the fourth position. Oh, and that's going to be a cut course for Grossman. Maybe looking in the mirror a little bit too much as he was way over those curbs. And sure enough, he pulls over. That's going to allow Jeremy Ravon through, allowed to catch up to these guys at the front. Oh, well, we've got a big problem for Casper to court. What happened here? This sends him down to 17th. This is into the Ford chicane. Uh, a little too much curb, looked like. There's yeah. that, that, that pendulum motion you were talking about with the rear of the car. Yeah, it just gets on that curb and then traction and then the car's round. Uh, nothing really you could do from there. Just the weight at the curb and the nature of the car. Uh, graphite racing team Porsche gets going once again. And you see he's got Darren Seal all over the back of him. Darren's going to get a good opportunity as we ride on the dash. Through Tertre Rouge, can he get the gun off the corner? He's going to be within the slipstream. About how far back, I don't know if you had a chance to run with other cars. Do you know uh, what the gap is that you need to be within to try and gain on the car ahead? I mean, you can sort of be anywhere from maybe two seconds at a push to a second and a half, but... Oh, and he hits the limiter. We can hear it now on board. But uh, as you were saying, the limiter is oh. a big factor to that. And who's that off? That's Decord again. Casper not having the best of days today, making a couple of mistakes. He's going to... He just wants some consistency now. Now, where's the slowdown, though? Hmm... 
Oh, there he goes. Now he's trying to give it back slowly, but surely. He's trying to, I think he's trying to hold him up and make it too wide into the corner. Now he lets him go. Darren Seal's finally fully through. Yeah, he was trying to give it back as late as possible, I think, to make force Darren to be side by side with him. Trying to lose as less time as possible. We're going to head down to the battle for P20. With Adam, Paul, and Ben Cooper's. Uh, right now, it is Parl ahead in that light blue and black machine that you see. Cooper's and the orange and blue machine. No surprise, Cooper's being blue and orange. Running for that Bitalux club once again. That car of Adam Paul seems to remind me of those golf cars a lot. Every time I look at it, it reminds me more and more of those cars. Very reminiscent colors. Not quite the same paint scheme, but oh, you can't go wrong with that combination. Just yeah. a beautiful paint scheme on that Porsche. As we ride on the rear wing of Ben. And once again, we can see that limiter just hitting the top end in these cars and denying them a chance once they get to Indianapolis. Looking through the order, Marco Derricks, having started 21st, now sits in 13th. He's made a fantastic climb, and he's not done, because up ahead of him, He's got Tor Anders Bervin. Got close coming into the Porsche curves, but had to lift and get out of it. David Barraclough, another guy that's been doing pretty well. Started P17, now up into the top 10, sitting in P9. Just a second back from Dennis Garrison. Barraclough we know on this channel from running in the Sox Out Racing Series. Used to driving Tin tops, of course, in that series, we saw him in NASCAR cup cars as well as NASCAR trucks. A little bit different than these Porsche Cup GT3s. Just a tad. We haven't looked at the leaders in a while, so why don't we jump up to Sindre and Eschhaus. Now, Clayson, since his mistake, he's not recovered into second. In fact, he's not terribly close behind them. Yeah, maybe just sort of struggling to find pace after that little off he had. Um, but he was struggling to find a way past Syndra, and Mika's struggling to find a way past Syndra. Maybe just the nature of the cars. We were talking about the slipstream may not be as effective as we, as we first thought. Certainly seems that way as we see him gain ground and then stall out yet again. He's not totally on the limiter from what we're hearing. Uh, Mika might be playing a long term here. Might be trying to save a little bit of fuel. This is going to bring Clayson's back in now. Oh, and Leaf with some problems. Down the order. Let's take a look at the replay. That sends him way down the order, actually. Oh. Uh, Oh, it looks like maybe something happened in real life that caused him to have to pull off the road. Unfortunate aspect of sim racing. Don't usually have to answer the door when uh, you're riding a Porsche around Le Mans in real life. How about Chris Fuller sitting in 10th? He's trying to do something on Mar Marcel Fassbender. Not to be confused with Michael. Oh, bad exit, though, from Chris Fuller. And you can see all the ground that he starts to lose. There's that orange and blue paint scheme. That must be a team. I'm trying to make out who those guys are. Sorry, I missed. Uh, we got a little bit of info. Torque Freak is who that team is. There we go. That makes sense now. They are a major presence we've seen in other series as well. Jeremy Ravon now finding himself on the back of these top three. Ah, we were waiting for this, making it a four-car fight now. Grossman's got to be kicking himself, knowing that he could have made it a five-way battle. 
but his error really has cost him dearly. He's still a whole three seconds back from these guys. Yep, seems to struggle. Seems to have struggled since that penalty. Just hasn't had the pace of Jeremy Ravon or the guys like Tim and Mika and Sindra. They work their way towards the Porsche curves one more time. There's one of those tort freak cars. At third in line is Tim Clayson's. A little bit farther down the order. Sounds like we got some action going on in 23rd. Jason Marischal. He's got Lars Moldenauer and Eustace De Vries very hot on his tail. Bit of a train behind him there forming. You've got sort of three cars and then you've got a couple more cars just sort of a second or so back. And that's Rowan Gill and Anders Christensen. Not going to make the obvious joke on that one, um, Jed. Don't worry. <laughs> He's thanking me for it. In fact, Christensen uh, needs to be looking behind him a little bit. Half his boss starting to close in on that yellow and black Porsche. Now coming through karting. I always thought this was the most difficult part of this series of S's. I can, I can only imagine what it must have been like, Joseph, back in the uh, 50s and 60s before they added these Porsche curves. These, these cars were flat out from Arnage down to that Dunlop curve past the start-finish line. That just must have been mind-boggling to see. Yeah, life threatening as well. These guys would be fighting for their life. Well, you've got to be very careful with, well, We'll move on from that and we're seeing our first stop of the day to Anders Bourbon in the pits. Indeed, hits his stall. We saw him enter on screen and we ducked away for a moment to check out the battle. And we come back to our top three. Once again, I'm starting to see Clayson's have a hard time holding on to the tail of these two. Makes me wonder if, Clay if Clayson's has any sort of damage or what on that car. So we ride on board with Tim. That car seems to be all clean from my perspective. I can't see any damage on that car. So maybe just he's sitting in the slipstream gaining slightly but not close enough to make the move. Well, we have seen him make a couple of mistakes, and you mentioned possibly those could have been lockups. Wonder if maybe the tires are a little bit more worn and he just doesn't have the grip off the corner. Could be that maybe those guys can accelerate more confidently. This time he does it much better out of the Michelin chicane. Same thing with the car behind, Jeremy Ravon, who uh, gets himself back on the tail again. He's been yo-yoing back and forth since we first saw him catch up. He'll gain, and then he'll maybe lose a little bit farther back in 12th spot actually more like 13th I'd say Stefan Overgaard familiar name on this channel Casper de Court remember trying to make up for his mistake he was much higher up he looks to the inside as they break down into the Molson corner and just like we said a little bit too hairy to try and go too wide through there so he backs out gets himself a good exit. He's going to be right tucked under that rear wing. Yeah, he was very, very close coming into the Molesine corner. Is he going to look Ooh. for another move here? A little, little bit of a naughty move there from, <laughs> from Overguard. Dodging in front of him at the last second. DeCourt still gets the run anyways. Looks around the outside. They come up to Indianapolis and he's much more confident on the brakes as the flying Smurf is going to let him through. Yeah, nice easy job there for Casper. Next up is Wilhelm Wilberg. The only thing that disappoints me is uh, we don't see the traditional smurf on Stefan's car. Whoa, who was that ducking off to the side? That's Wilberg. Wilberg. That's Wilberg. Let's watch the replay. What do you think happened here, Joseph? Well, from what I saw, he just sort of went off. and I'm going to go with traction, I'm guessing. Just traction out of the corner. 
lost the rear end, maybe got on the curb a bit. Yeah, he's around. He did a beautiful job catching it before it hit the Armco, though. Brought the car back, and he salvaged 14th, though he lost two positions in the process as he now sits behind Overgaard. Very closely behind Overgaard, we should say. Uh, but a bad exit out of karting. It's going to deny him the chance as they head up to the Ford chicane. All the cars accordioning back together. And they complete one more lap. We are on lap eight out of 23. Still a long ways to go as we check in with our leaders yet again. And these top four have not separated for a number of laps now. In fact, they are starting to pull away from Simon Grossman in fifth, who lost them back when he had an error out of the final quarter. Yeah, he's going to be kicking himself after that. Could have been with these guys. Could have been a five-way battle. Could have had a chance at a podium. I mean, he's still got a chance, but Jeremy Ravon seems to be the favourite compared to Simon at the moment. Maybe he can catch up at the stops. Yeah, at this point, he's got to hope for a good pit stop. And maybe for these guys to start battling a little, they've been very well behaved so far. No surprise with them being at the top of their game. Very fast paced. Everybody up here knows what's going on in terms of the length of this race and how the strategy plays out. As they come back out of the Forza chicane onto the Molson straight. All sitting in the slipstream, all four of them following each other one by one but still no real gains to be made all sitting very similar as they did at the start of straight so the slipstream doesn't seem to be having as big of an effect as we first thought Joe yeah I feel like that that pit limiter well not pit limiter that uh, rev limiter is certainly affecting it and also drivers maybe saving fuel so they could possibly if they wanted to, we suspect, but we can't totally confirm. I understand uh, 19th is relatively close to any Veller. We haven't seen since early on in the race has Martin Hilliger's and Ben Cupis, Cooper's, excuse me, trying to chase him down. And in fact, they're not too far behind Adam Parle. If he makes an error, he could be right on top of them. All it takes is a slowdown and these three are on the back of him. There you see that orange machine is Weller. Hilliger is under threat because Cooper's gets himself a good run, but he runs out of track as they break for Molson. Could set himself up out of the corner up to Indianapolis. And he's within touching distance. Flying through no name. And then up by golf. But once again, you, you said it. I Really good observation, Joseph. Just, man, it, it, I, I almost, I feel like maybe for some of it is Hilliger's was in the draft of Veller. So I wonder if it's a case of if the car ahead of you is in a draft, it really, you're, you're almost at a stalemate because you're both pulling but you can't catch him because he's getting an extra bit of speed from the car ahead himself. Yeah, essentially it just cancels out what you're getting and you're not getting that gain. Uh, but if we look back to the lead, Sintra seems to have pulled a bit Ooh. of a gap to Mika for the first time in this race. This could be critical. He's really got to hustle because they've got at least a decent amount of turns on the first part of the circuit before they get to the Molson. We'll see as S-House struggles to get the power down and is now looking over his shoulders because Tim Clayson closes in. Got a good opportunity here if he can do it into Dunlop. Let's see if he takes a look. Ooh, slightly defensive. So, so S-House is starting to feel threatened. Big mistake from Clayson, though, is going to ruin that chance. And here comes Jeremy Ravon down to the inside, into the chapel rundown. 
side by side towards the Forest S's. There's banking here, but not enough to pull it off, and Ravon has to back off. So that splits our top four into pairs of two. Yeah, we saw some flash in there. Glassen's there. He's going to have a look down the Mozan straight. He's separated, so he's not going to get the benefit of the slipstream from Mika S House. This is way too far back to hit for him to get any sort of draft advantage. So the 451 put on the back foot yet again. He recovered before, but I'm not sure if he's going to be able to do it this time. Behind them, Bass Lob and 14th worrying about David Haynes. He slowly closes him in as the cars get wound up. Speed increasing, flying past all the businesses and houses. And then they woe it up into the braking for Forza. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this a lot, but the slipstream just doesn't have that effect that we first thought. We thought that we we're going to see drivers fly by each other the whole race, but that just doesn't seem to be the case, Joe. Certainly is making a bit of a tease for us, expecting to see some battles up and down the order. The drivers very much having a hard time. Behind them, Seal and Vilberg. But Vilberg stalls out now. They break for the Michelin chicane. Let's see if Vilberg can set him up coming off the corner. Oh, horrible middle of the chicane. Just look at how much it costs him. So that's going to ruin that battle. Uh, up at the front, Clayson's is apparently lost out to Ravon. Let's take a look at the replay here, Joseph. This is coming down to the Molson corner. Just gets himself a nice little run. Orange and blue Porsche really had no answer. As he takes the inside line. And Ravon... Outguns him on the brakes. That's Hasn't given up, though. Go ahead. That's the first time we've really seen near the front that the slipstream has actually worked for one of the drivers to make a move. Certainly executed it beautifully. That was textbook stuff from Jeremy Ravon. Remember, he started in second, so this third place is still a step down for him. He's going to want to try and get up there and catch S-House and Syndra. Two pairs of two peds in a pod. As S-House follows in the tire tracks of Sets Us, we ride on board right now with Ravon. As we jump off and see all four of our top four now. Hmm, slightly defensive. Oh, and down into the Couple pits goes the pits. Sets Us. Oh, yeah. but Sessos with a mistake. Turns it around. He's followed in by Ravon. We're going to watch the onboard. Oh, we mentioned it early on in the broadcast, that pit entry. He knows it. He knows he's too hot. He's trying so hard to make the corner. The Scandinavian, unfortunately may have thrown away the lead. Well, if Jeremy Ravon has a nice clean pit stop, he's definitely lost the lead to him. And it's a shame who's to Sinjo who's absolutely dominated this race so far. Hasn't really no one's got past him apart from Tim once and he got back past straight away. So maybe our first proper lead change of this race. Here we're seeing a lot of cars coming in. This appears to be the lap. S-House, we, we heard him lifting earlier, and he's able to continue on, so that is curious. Oh, Ravon's staying in. Grossman and Mittner are out before them. Hmm, curious difference in pitch strategy. Oh, and Ravon is taking tires, we understand, and that is not expected. Wow. 
That is an interesting one. I wasn't expecting that. We were expecting just fuel. Uh, maybe them tyres just not feeling nice. Um, with the traction, of course, if they're not feeling too good. Obviously, rear engine car can put more force on the rear end and the rear tyres and struggle with traction. But strange there. And this will allow Setos to not lose his position over Ravon, at least. The real eyes need to be on S-House and Clayson. Clayson's starting to close in on Mika as well. They're both going to have to have a really good outlap, and I think inlap even, sorry. I think they can definitely jump Syndra there. If Syndra, Syndra's obviously lost time from having that spin. A little bit of a loss of the rear end for Mika, but manages to hold it. No mistake there for Sin Mika. But going back to Syndro, he's made that mistake and he's lost time, not to Jeremy, but to Mika and Tim. Now, put yourself in the shoes of Clayson's. Do you go on the attack? Do you try to pass? Well, we'll find out here in a second. And he does go on the attack. He's not worried about what's going to happen with the pit stops. He is going to streak on by. Yeah, nice clean move there from Tim and that puts him into the lead of this race. Managed to do it on the straight, so really no time lost for Clayson's. Question is, are they going to pit this time by? Highest pitter right now is Michael Mittner. He sits in 11th. We're still waiting for a number of the top runners to come in. Clayson's S-House, Garrison, Overgaard, Haynes, Slob, Parle, DeVries, Christensen, and Gill. All top 10 have not come in for their stop yet. Should bridge corner. Go ahead. We should see these top two guys in. Uh, to my calculations, they're probably going to come in. Is that traffic behind them? Yeah, it is. Is that traffic? We're going to stay on board to watch him enter. Let's see if either he or Clayson's also has an error on the pit entry. Have they practiced? Do they know how early to break? Looking a lot more tidy to me. Indeed, both cars through the first part of the pit entry. And then they hit the pit limiter. Singer's going to be kicking himself when he finds out that they've both had clean entries if they don't take tires. Stefan Overgaard's still worried about David Haynes. They come up to the pit entry. We expect everybody who hasn't pitted to come in this time. And indeed, those three line astern. So where is Mittner here? And now coming through Maison Blanche. I wonder... I wonder, we we talked about one stop versus two stop. I wonder if all those other drivers are basically doing a long stop and then a very short splash and dash, and Mittner may be splitting it more evenly, and that's why he had such a short stop? Maybe, uh, but we've seen, an, seen a lot of the guys, 19.1 for Mittner, obviously, but 21.1, 22.1 for Tim, 22.3 for Mika, but Sindra had a slow stop. So Sindra finds him way down the order after he stopped behind Dennis Gerson by the looks of it. Yeah, he's all the way back in six. In fact, why don't we run through our order of the top 10 now that we've had our first set of stops through? Tim Clayson's now your leader. That move wound up being critical for him getting past Mika S. who is currently P2 having started this race in third. Still a very good race for Mika, and he's still within the slipstream, so I'm sure this battle will continue on until something, someone makes an error, or maybe Tim can push a little bit harder to try and break that draft. Michael Mittner, still not sure how he managed to have a short stop, but we think that maybe he's splitting up his pit stops a little bit differently than other drivers. That gets him into third. Then Simon Grossman did the same thing, getting himself into fourth behind them. He's only a second and a half behind Mittner at the moment. If you go to fifth, you mentioned him before. Dennis Garrison, not a bad job by him. 
to get himself into the top five. He started in ninth. What about the back half of the top ten there, Joseph? Well, we have our former race leader, Sindre Satas, who finds himself P6 after that slow stop and his little spin, David Barraclough in P7, and the 49er Marcel Fassbender. He had a pretty strong race so far. Casper de Court finds himself up in P9 after having a difficult first stint for him there. And Stefan Odegaard is the final man in the top 10 currently. With that, we are going to take... Oh, we might not want to take a break now because a pass for the lead is happening as S-House pulls the move on Tim Clayson's down in a Molson corner. They get very close together at the apex, but Clayson's manages, manages to stay out of him. And if these boys will settle down, we can take a little bit of a breather here, and I think they will. All right. I think we're good at this point between these two because Clayson's does not appear to be catching quick enough to have a go into Indianapolis, I don't believe at least. Yes, he lifts before they hit the corner. So with that, we'll be back after just a moment here on the Global Sim Racing channel. Stick around. You'll see the latter half of the gathering of Tweakers 195 here at Le Mall. Welcome back to the Circuit de la Sarthe, better known as Le Mans. We are now on lap 12 of our 23 lap race in the gathering of Tweakers Porsche Super Cup 195. Right now, your leader is Mika Ashouse after pulling a great move on Tim Clayson's. Those have been uh, a great back and forth, but we did have an incident with Derek's earlier on. Marco Derek's coming through our Nage. Let's take a look and see what happened to him. This is entering Indianapolis. It's in a nice little battle there. I'm not sure who that blue and yellow Porsche is. Seems like he gets a good run on him. 
thinks about a pass, oh, but thinks a little too hard as he loses it on entry. Great avoidance maneuver by both cars that sneak on through. Let's watch on board, Marco. This is a good example of what you, you mentioned of the braking being so tough in these things. As we come back live. Well, a mistake from Tim Clayson's. He had gotten back into the lead when we weren't watching, and he gives it away coming through Indianapolis. Let's take a look at the replay, and I'm not sure when he managed to get by. Oh, it was actually right here on, on the run to Indianapolis that he slipped stream past here, Joseph, but I've done this many a times. It's so hard to judge the braking with that, that kink there into that left-hander. Yeah, it's not an easy corner with the braking, uh, especially with the kink. And you're sort of turning while turning while you're braking, so uh, it's difficult. Maybe it's just a slight lock up into the gravel, and that's the lead to Mika. But he's still on the back of him, so he hasn't lost much time uh, to Mika S house. As this has been going on, Michael Mittner has been dropping off bit by bit. He's now four seconds back in the third spot. We do believe. That is only on strategy at the moment. He may have to hand that back with his second stop, which could be a longer one. Well, a short one, just uh, longer than what we've seen or what we expect to see with the other drivers. They stopped. We were, we were talking about this on the break, Joseph. They stopped on 11 on a 23-lap race. That seems incredibly marginal. Yeah, just before halfway into the race, as we were speaking about in the pre-race, you can't really risk it with fuel because it's such a long lap. And if if you run out of fuel, you're essentially going to have to get a tow because you're not going to be crawling around all that all that way. So maybe some of these guys doing the two, some of these guys risking it with the one with, say, a longer stop. But not 100% about the stops yet. We'll just have to wait and see as it comes in the next few laps. That's us trying to run away from Bearclaw as we saw down in 6th and 7th. If we could jump a little bit farther back to 25th, Hampus Baz has been hassling the machine of Denny Veller. As they come onto the front stretch, Denny did a great job out of this last chicane to start to put some distance because, boy, coming through the Porsche curves, Hampus's car was looking very strong. Up and under the Dunlop Bridge they go. Down end of the chapel run down. What time Boz has gained, he's not be able to regain, it seems. So not as strong at the start of the lap as he is at the end of the lap. Now they hit Tertrouge. Can he gun it off the corner better? Just slightly, but the draft, as we've seen, not as effective today, and so don't think this is going to give him an opportunity. Well, sounds like you spotted Adam. something a little bit farther down, Joseph. Yeah, Adam Paul has just managed to find himself past Martin Hilligers down the back straight on the slipstream and made that move nice and clean back past. Yeah, that moves him up into 21st, having started 27th. So they come down the Molson straight yet again. Behind them, am I seeing correctly? Oh, no, he's moved up past them since then. Tom Jansen actually up into 20th. Oh, how close are the leaders here? Because they look close on my timing and scoring, and they are within a 10th. The Claysons is going to elect to hold back. Apparently a little bit shaken by Indianapolis last time through. So, whoa, and the car behind. That's Kip Stevens spinning in front of the leaders. He has a lap down. We stay with our leaders. Kip able to get it turned around without hitting anything. But Garrison, one of our leaders, did hit something, and that is the Armco. Uh, he's got it rolled up. It looks good, but the last little bit of braking. Watch the tail break. 
Bam. Not a whole lot of damage, but oh, these long straights, it's, that's going to make him hurt the rest of the race through. That aero damage isn't going to help him on the straights either. The slipstream hasn't been effective, as we've seen, but with a bit of damage, that's going to slow your car right down. It certainly will. So that puts Fassbender up in a seventh. As Garrison collected himself and got back on track, trying to get back past him with that position that he lost. Our leaders, though, still incredibly close. They came out of the final chicane, just barely two tenths apart. Clayson's holding on to the tail of S House, but not going to have a go down in a Dunlop. S House holds to the racing line, does not defend. Oh, much tidier through the second half. Here comes Clayson. Gets right under the rear wing. But they come up to the Forest S's. And just not much breaking there. Not many chance to try and sneak by. No, not there. Not really a passing opportunity, but he's gotten it even closer now. Is he going to have a look down the mole sand into the first cane? In he that slipstream. Yeah, he is right on top of him. Closes in. Where's the limiter going to start to affect him? Or will he lift potentially? Looks to the inside. S House, no defense. He's got the speed. As they get to the end, they've got lap traffic. Sneaks inside. Clayson's takes over P1. That lap traffic may have played into the favor of Tim Clasens. Yeah, I, I get the feeling that Mika kind of saw that coming, decided, eh, I don't want to be involved in this. I'll just let him have it for now. Just in case they went three wide. Now, we haven't checked in on Grossman in a while. He's still sitting in fourth. Remember, he had that slowdown early on. And he's a bit in no man's land, but what is Setsus doing? Let's see, what does his laps look like? Because I'm curious if he's faster than Grossman with them being all by themselves. Well, we go down to the battle for P6. Dave Barraclough and Marcel Fassbender. Fassbender has just managed to get past David there. Into the second chicane. With the slipstream, playing to good effect for a couple of these drivers now. Uh, managing to get past. So P6 for Marcel Fassbender now. And don't forget, though, we can't take away from Baraclaw and the effort that he's made starting 17th, getting himself up into 7th is very impressive. The, uh, one thing I always stress is when you see a driver go from dead last to halfway through the field in a 60 car field, it's imp oh, as we got a battle for the lead and Mika slipstreams by. Tim Clayson's lets him have it. This is starting to look maybe a little bit more like teamwork between these two. Yeah, they're not sort of, they're trying to not lose as much time as possible, just trying to keep it between them two. They don't want Mitchell Michael Mitner coming up to the back of them. They want to keep it a two-car battle, making it nice and easy for them. And it's working so far with about a five-second gap between Clayson's and Mitner currently. But the, the point that I was getting at, when you're at the back of the field, it sounds impressive and it's very cool and you feel proud when you go from the very back to somewhere in the mid-pack and overtake 30 cars. But it's when you get to the sharp end, overtaking is so, so much harder. Uh, to me, it almost means more when you see someone go from 17th to 7th. Yeah, I mean, near the, near the front, there seem, you know, less incidents, really, with the faster guys. And, it's, you know, you're going to, if you're passing a world championship driver, for example, it's not going to be as easy as passing a driver who's a rookie at iRacing. It's going to be a lot easier, isn't it, at the back? And, positions at the back is easier to come by but people want that first position more they want that top five more than say a p35 you gotta fight so much harder defend harder we haven't seen a lot of that from our two leaders as we jump back to Barraclaw. claw 
there at the tail of them, or at the front of them. And fifth, if we could look to sets us. And let's take a look at his lap times. 4032, 4027, 4028. Now what is Grossman doing? 404. Oh, he's much faster than Grossman. So sets us is actually running him down. So Setsus, despite uh, seemingly running a bit of a skeleton crew here in the latter half, is really making it a fight. Oh, and we got a driver taking a second stop. This is Slob. First of the second stoppers. He's got a bit of damage to that car, so maybe a bit of a repair. And absolutely took his free repair, Ben Cooper's as well in. Boss, I've heard from some of the drivers on the iRacing forums have voted his name the best name on iRacing. I kind of, I don't know if it's the best, but I agree it is absolutely up there. It's a very, very good name. I've seen some uh, very interesting names on iRacing in my, well, six months of iRacing, but my favorite is Boogie Woogie. That's a, <laughs> I'm not I, sure I if think, that one's real. I, I, doesn't seem right, but we'll move down to P12 now. Ooh, getting very close together. David Haynes leading Darren Seal, and they get it sorted out by the time they hit the fours of Chicane. Whew, that was tight. Darren almost unnecessarily getting up to the rear quarter panel of David Haynes. We have some news from the front for the battle for the lead. Mika S. House and Tim Klassen's I think we're going to get a replay of it now. Oh, Mika's just going to take the escape road there. Locked up on the brakes. Has to go around the tyre barriers there. Uh, finds himself behind him. Oh, yeah. He's now full 1.2 seconds back. We're going to watch on board. There's no contact here. This is just Mika. Once again, those brakes that you talked about. The rear of the car just oh, gets evil and... He does a beautiful job of keeping it from going completely around. Yeah, lucky to keep it around there. Damage limitation, not making any real sort of mistakes. Lost a bit of time, but it's a lot less than he could have. So at this point as a driver, Joseph, do you, I mean, what do you do to try to get yourself back in the game? Because Mika has to know that, that he's lost the draft to, to Tim. So mentally what how do you manage to to get yourself buck you know away from what just happened and focused on what's in front of you i mean you know you could say just ignore it but it's very hard to do that you're in a tough battle for the lead in a long long race and it's not as easy as just saying oh yeah forget about it it's just one corner but you've kind of got to do that you kind of just got to carry on what you've been doing the past 14 laps keep it clean keep it consistent and then you know you should find your way back up there i mean 1.4 seconds ish um back from tim classens now i mean it's not a horrible gap but he's going to be losing that draft so hopefully he can get back up there and we can see a battle for the lead once again oh Clayson's with a slowdown and a final chicane, and that was the other thing I was going to mention. Sometimes you just have to focus ahead because you got to wait for a mistake from the leader, and it came a lot earlier than we expected. Maybe just the pressure got to him. Um, first real time he's had the lead this race, and pressure just got to him. Mika's made that mistake. He wants to pull away from Mika, and he's just pushed that bit too much and got that slowdown penalty. This is the third time we've seen cars have difficulty under braking uh, in quick succession. Remember, we saw, I believe it was Bearclaw having trouble into Indianapolis. Do you think maybe the tires are starting to go off and that's that's affecting the handling, possibly? Yeah, for sure. That could be a factor for these guys, the tires going off, making it more difficult under braking for them. We'll have to carry on and see what happens if we see a couple more incidents like that on screen tour anders bevan 
has a very banged up front end of this car and he's coming in for a pit stop. Now this could be scheduled, but that is some serious damage on the front of that Porsche. Yeah, I mean it could be a routine stop, but there's a lot of damage to that car, so I'm guessing it must be some kind of repair. Certainly been in the wars as we jump up to the battle for 12th position. Darren Seal leads David Haynes, leads Chris Fuller. We've watched these three before. Are they going to go at it again? Fuller gaining ground. He's been looking if he wants to, but before he can do that, David Haynes pops to the inside. They come down to the force of chicane. Is Darren Seal going to be able to outbreak him? No, he cannot. They're going to be side by side into the corner. And Haynes just not enough to try and get that car through. So we have back to the lead. Going side by side. Mika on the inside. And Tim Klassens has taken that position. Well, managed to hold it from Mika there. Not allowing Mika past. Tim keeps P1. We'll now head down to P12. Yeah, back to this fight. Fuller finds himself up to the front. He got a great run going all the way up to the engine of this train of three. And that puts Darren Seal and David Haynes at each other's throats instead as they watch the car of Fuller start to streak away from them a little bit. Now they pull up to the Molson corner. We're going to see another move into here. No. Looks like Haynes is going to back out. Big lockup, though, from the car Fuller. He goes all the way off into the gravel. That's going to compromise his exit. Here comes Darren Seal to the inside. Through no name, then up to the kink of golf. They start to even out as they're still door to door in the popcorn position. David Haynes giving watch. Now they hit the breaking of Indianapolis. Is anybody going to give way? No. Still a battle. Fuller's going to have the inside of the left-hander. They almost come together. Darren Seal almost cuts off the car of Haynes as he has to catch it. Goes into the grass. Comes back on track. Still, your order is Fuller, Seal, Haynes. Yeah, it looked like David Haynes was just sort of waiting for an incident between the two drivers ahead of him and just pushed that car a bit too much. Managed to hold it. Still only finds himself four times behind Darren Seal, but Chris Fuller now the leader of that pack. Haynes learned of the pitfalls of that popcorn position because when things go wrong in front of you, you have to make the avoidance maneuvers. So it still is going to be Fuller in 12th. That move down the back stretch on the Molson straight proved to be a pretty wily one for that orange machine. We're going to head down to the battle for P18 and P19. Eustace Vries and Martin Hilligers and Adam Pohl just behind them. Eustace Vries has just got past Martin there before we went to the shot. They come out of the Porsche curves. Through Maison Blanche. Nobody really close enough to have an attempt here. The question is, when are we going to see drivers take that second stop? None of these three are going to elect to come in this time by. But I understand Decourt comes in. Yes, indeed. And that car is spick and span, so I figure this is very much a scheduled stop for him. I'm keeping on what happens to him. And he's out and away. 15.5 so just fuel to get to the end exactly first car to take that is going to be coming out in 24th so that's our marker oh excuse me we did see slob take a second stop before him as well as coopers but this does mean that decourt is the highest car who can make it to the end at the moment Our lead still is with Tim Clayson's in P1 and Mika Asshouse in second. Asshouse really pushing the car, stringing it all the way out almost to the Armco coming out of the Michelin chicane. 
He's within the draft. But I think he's going to hold back. Yeah, we do not see an attack down into the Molson corner. Now, you've been keeping an eye on Setsis. Oh, and never mind. We'll stick with this. Once again, we see cars struggling under braking. Tim Clayson's throws it off course. Let's watch the replay. Getting up to 170 miles an hour, being accurate on that brake marker, Joseph, is no mean feat. Nope, it is not. What's gonna happen? Is he gonna sneak it moving there? He's very wide though. Yeah. Looked like it went deep into there, but hasn't really lost too much time to make of that. Just keeps it on the road. I'm, I'm starting to think that Clayson's is struggling the way that that car is driving. Just doesn't seem at all happy or comfortable with the car at the moment in the recent laps with the mistakes that he's been making. Now, uh, before that <laughs> incident <laughs> into the Molson corner happened, I noticed that you had no noted something about Setsus. Yeah, I mean, obviously in that first stint before lap 11 uh, with the pit stops, he well was leading the race since from the beginning, started on pole, comfortable position in qualifying, and wouldn't really let anyone past, managed to keep it that way until lap 11 made a mistake going into the pit entry. That cost him dear, lost him time, had a slower stop than these guys, and just hasn't really been anywhere since. He was P6, someone came in, or he got past someone, I believe, and finds himself in P5. We, he was going and gaining on Simon Grossman at one point, but it's just sort of been in no man's land as Tim Classens has spun coming out of the final corner. Sorry about that, going on that, but... We're gonna watch the replay. By the looks of it, said he wasn't comfortable in that car. That's allowed Simon Grossman through. Yeah, this was just coming out of the corner. Rear pendulums on around. Does a little pirouette to get it pointed forward. And as that was happening, uh, we might be able to catch a little bit on the side. No, we can't see him. A yellow machine. I think that was... Mitner. Mitner. Mitner's in. Yeah, Mitner's in for his second stop of the day. So we come back live. Mitner is in and out and done. So where is this going to put him? Well ahead of the court, I believe. He tumbles down the orders as more cars streams by. Currently sitting 12th. And that is where he will cycle through to. He started 11th. So actually a position lost effectively thus far. But we have a lot of other cars yet to pit in front of him. Yeah, he's the leading guy that has made two stops from my telemetry. So he's in a good position at the moment. He's just got, got to hope that the guys ahead make that stop. But he had a slow pit lane, but a very short stop. 1 minute point two for the lane and 13.8 for the stop. So maybe a mistake or just didn't get going after the stop. Stefan Overgaard has come in and out for his second stop. And in fact, that puts him right smack dab in the middle of a battle with Casper de Court, who is also done with his, his pit strategy. So the flying Smurf comes onto the Molson straight up ahead of them. That is Cedric Bolin. That is for position, but he's not too worried about what's through the windscreen because Decourt got a fantastic run on him. Pulls off to the inside. They're going to be door to door into the Forza chicane. And they hit the pit limiter. So it comes down to the brakes. Who's braver? Decourt at first. And he gets through. Rev limiter, not pit limiter, excuse me. And Clayson's, after his mistake, remember Grossman got past him. Well, he's reversed that, moved Clayson's into P2. Yep, just hoping to redo 
well, undo what he did with that incident. He's got six point six seconds to catch up to Mika S House. It's not going to be easy. We've got five laps to go, four laps to go ish. Um, yeah, so five to go when we next come around, and he's got five point nine seconds to make up and get past. It's going to be tight, and you know, pit stops as well with regards to fuel. But we'll just have to wait and see how it pans out, I guess. As we watch our leader, this is Mika Asshouse. Been up at the front for a few laps now and has certainly got himself a nice handy gap since Tim Clayson's mistake. Oh, and did Fuller have an issue? Yes, he did. This is out of Arnage once again. These these slow corners really seem to be the most difficult for these Porsches. Yeah, I think again we've spoken about the distribution of the car rear engine. And just that just seems to be the way the, the characteristics and the way the car handles. And Grossman now comes in for his scheduled stop. I understand. We and have sets us. Loads of cars in. Fastbender, oh, wow. Barraclough, Garrison, Ravon, all down the pit lane at the moment. Should be a nice easy stop for all of them, just fuel. It's an absolute parade down there in the pit lane. Sets us, hits his stall. We're curious to see where he is going to come out right now. Driver to watch, Michael Mittner, the highest driver with his second pit done. Grossman coming out. Mittner's actually going to get them. Yeah, he's jumped them. So he's done it really well there, even though having a very slow pit lane. Thinking about it, he's had a minute pit lane. Imagine if he had a similar pit lane to those guys there. Uh, imagine how close he'd be to the front. But moving on, those guys, the early, the undercutters obviously work then. This has been a beautiful bit of strategic maneuver for Michael Mittner to get himself into fourth and probably could get one more. He's got David Haynes up ahead of him. So we know that Haynes needs to stop still. Clayson's and S House might be too far ahead, though. Yeah, uh, Haynes is just ahead. So easy move for him when he comes in. It's just about what happens with the front. He's got a 40 second gap and most of the guys have had a 40 to 45 ish second pit lane. So it's going to be tight between those guys there. Fascinating stuff as the race plays itself out. We're getting down into the dying stages again. If you're just joining us here on the Global Sim Racing Channel, welcome to the gathering of tweakers Porsche Super Cup 195 it has been a fantastic little battle for a number of spots throughout this race we've seen some great action now did Minder just make a mistake no he did not I'm sorry I thought he did a weird line through the Michelin chicane but he's perfectly fine a little bit behind him in fifth sets us He's looking behind himself again. Grossman. Both of them have finished their stop, so from here on out, it's who is better out on the track. Grossman reels him in as they come up to the Molson corner. He runs out of track before he can pass him. It's the first reaction we've seen from Syndra after his incident, really. He's just been a lone wolf in the middle of no man's land. Wolf versus a polar bear, apparently, today as Grossman stays in the tire tracks of Setsis. Coming up to the kink of Indianapolis. And he's just gonna hold back, not gonna make an attack here yet. The question two is, are these, even though Mittner maybe got them on pit strategy, is he faster out on track? Are they going to start to reel him in potentially and gun him down? Mittner blinking a bit, am I seeing right? 
S House is coming in. All right, our leader hits pit lane. First chicane, nice and tidy. And he comes down to the pit limiter. Glasson stays out, though. Ooh, and he was not looking good through the first part of the Ford chicane. He was way wide. Clearly, the Benelux driver is just continuing to push harder and harder to get more out of it. And I think it's hurting him, him if anything. Yeah, I think if I was him, I'd just, I would have followed Mika in. I don't really see a need to continue. Just come in, get it in as early as possible. Maybe he's trying to one-stop this thing. I'm not sure. Haynes continues on. And Mittner does need to worry. Let's see, is Eschaus out? He's coming out now. It's going to be pretty close between himself and Mittner. Will he get up to speed? I think he's got it. Meek has yeah. got it. You are correct. He's ahead of Haynes, even. Now, this is where I was curious. Haynes stayed out. He has not come in. So there's no blue flags. This is for position. Mittner could be slowed up by Haynes here. This could hurt his race strategy. Yeah, it won't do him any favors there. Interesting to see what Klassens does. Will he do the one stop? We're on lap 20 currently. Uh, it's a 23 lap race, so three and a half laps to go essentially. I mean, these guys have come in sort of four or five laps before the end. So he would have had to win his fuel saving that whole stint. So the drivers remaining yet to pit. Tim Clayson's in the lead. David Haynes in third. We've got Yus De Vries in 11th. He's continued on. Adam Parle as well in 12th is still on his first stop. Rowan Gill in 16th has yet to stop, and he is the last of the cars trying to stretch it as far as it'll go. And this is a battle for position that we're watching down in 17th. That's Slob to the inside of Rowan Gill. Slob's done with his stops. Gill, we think, might need one more. And he is going to easily outbreak him into the Forza chicane. And unfortunately, it's not over for Gill. Marco Derricks behind him as well. Gets a great run. Going to be within the slipstream. Already looking to the outside as they come up to the Michelin chicane. I have to wonder if Gill may be trying to fuel save just a little bit. Is he one of those that thinks that maybe he can get all the way to the end? And that spot goes away to Derek, so move Gill down to 18th now. Up at the very front, Tim Clayson's all by his lonesome. He's been in the fight for pretty much the entire race for the lead, but self-made mistakes have cost him so much. And at this point, just trying to make up ground. So he works his way through the Porsche curves. He stops, I believe he said lap 11. Is that correct, Joseph? Yeah, I believe so. Um, is he going to come in? We'll find out now. Yes, he, yes is. he is. So, looks like we won't have any one-stoppers at the front today. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to David Haynes. We'll see when he comes around. But our focus is on Tim Clarsons at the moment. Pit limiter on. Good entry for Tim. Much to the dismay of Setsas. One of the few drivers we've seen really turn it around on that pit entry. With how much he was out front, he is just got to be so frustrated. This is Mika Eshaus in second coming through. We expect him to re-inherit the lead. Tim finally stops in his stall just now, actually. Haynes finally comes in. That releases Michael Mittner. 
And Clayson's is out. Mittner goes by. Syndra is going to come up right behind him, but he's not going to have enough pace. So Tim stops the bleeding at the bottom of the podium. Manages to keep hold of that final spot off the champagne. If he stays where he is, he will get that trophy and his champagne. Syndra not too far behind, and he's eyeing that down. Now down to three laps to go. Mika Eshaus has finished his second stop. Mittner has finished his second stop. And the gap between them is 2.8 seconds. Mittner's previous laps. Give it a 4037, 4036, 4035, 4025, 4028. Very fast on since his out laps. Eshaus before he went in. 404, 403, 404. Mm. So we'll have to see if he picks up the pace like Mittner did after his final stop. Closest battle up at the top is between fourth and fifth. That sets us and Grossman. Two drivers that have certainly had their fair share of errors on this race and yet despite that their pace has meant they're looking at rounding up a top five here at the French track yeah they've had the pace though they've made the mistakes they've had the consistency when they haven't made those mistakes um, pick themselves back up from those and just focused on what the job in hand and that's why they're in the top five Behind them for six, Barraclaw, Fassbender. A nice little tussle as they come out of the Michelin chicane. We were wondering if it was going to be one stop or two stops. Well, it is a solid two stops as everybody in the field has come in for their second one. To the inside goes Fassbender. Barraclaw gives that one up. He breaks very early and lets him through. Yeah, I guess it's near the end of the race and he doesn't really want it. Oh, and Overguard has a problem into the Michelin chicane. This is down in 17th. Looks like as he's trying to stay out of the back of Bass Slob, he locks up the brakes and woo, great job by Derek's behind him to make an avoidance. Watch on board. Comes up into the corner. You can see almost just a bit of a panic moment as he gets so close. So that brings us back live. And actually, Bass Slob had another moment in Molson corner that allowed Chris Fuller to get through. So Fuller moves up to 12th. And you can see after that, he has just stretched away. Back up P3, Tim Classens and Sindre getting very, very close. Sindre really eyeing up, eyeing up that top three. Just two temps between them. I thought Sindre was actually uh, just ahead of Grossman half a lap ago. So, boy, he's got the bit between his teeth now. And poor Clayson's, who we've seen has not been good with the pressure, has got even more of it dumped over his head. wants to, for his team, Radicals in line, doesn't want to show that the incident was the only thing that happened for him today. He wants to show them that he can get that podium. Oh, and Clayson's buckles yet again as he cuts the Dunlop chicane, slowing down, having to give up the time to Setsis. So, Put sets us up into the podium with two laps to go. What looked like maybe a ruined race after a horribly embarrassing pit entry. Sets us has now got in his sights Michael Mittner, only two and a half seconds up the road. And Clayson's worries continue because Grossman 
now goes on by. Cars flat out down the Molson straight. Nothing he could do as they hit the rev limiter. And break for the Forza Chicane. Put Grossman into fourth. Clayson's now down to fifth. Back a little bit farther. 12th place, Fuller and Slob side by side coming out of Tertre de Rouge. Fuller's going to get the advantage on that one. Excuse me, Slob is going to get the advantage on that one. Slob in the white Porsche ahead. Fuller in the orange and blue machine. All four cars that you see on screen and for position, Derek's goes on by. Fuller with a very early lift. Is Fuller maybe short on fuel? That as he swings the car through there and almost loses it. That's going to give a spot up to Tom Jansen and to Casper de Court potentially. Jansen, remember, started this race in fifth, was up with the leaders fighting for the, the win earlier on. Well, right now he's all the way down in 14th. Two laps to go here. And it is coming down to this. It's two and a half seconds between the lead. Eshwi, Eshaus, excuse me, and Mittner. And two and a half seconds between second and third, Mittner and Setsas. Klassens and Grossman battling. The P4, they're side by side ever since that mistake. Tim Klassens has been struggling. Sindre has been able to pull away get a couple of seconds between the two. Fossens must be ruining his setup decision because this car, as the race has gone on, just has looked more and more evil underneath him. As we ride on board with Grossman, going through the Porsche curves now, waiting for the opportunity. I'm not sure if he's been aware of Clayson's mistake because he knows that maybe just Putting the pressure on could maybe get him a spot. Doesn't want to tussle with him too long because Setsus is coming up behind these two. No, excuse me, Setsus is ahead of these two, I should say. Setsus isn't too far behind Michael Mintner. We're going into the final lap now. He gained an entire second. Yeah, 1.6 seconds, 1.4 seconds between wow. the two of them now. Just gained two tenths through for 1.2. Sindre wants this. Oh, he is pushing hard as we watch the battle behind him. Slightly defensive from Clayson's. This time much tighter through there, but Garrison, oh, Garrison has an off in the Ford chicane. This was absolutely driver error all by his lonesome. A little too hot in, just barely nudges it into the tires. That sends him down to 10th. By the looks of it, Sindra's, Sindra sets us, has had a slowdown penalty and Tim Clastons and Simon Grossman find themselves all over the rear of that Radicals car. Well, with the white flag out, that's going to mean that first and second are not on the cards for sets us unless they have a major error. Possible, but we'll have to wait and see. The checkered flag will tell all. They work their way through the Forza chicane. Mittner losing ground as well. He's gone up to 3.2 seconds back from Eschau, so maybe Mittner himself had a slowdown somewhere. Your order in this train that we're watching. Third is sets us. Fourth, Clayson's. Fifth, Grossman. Grossman looks to the inside as they come to the Michelin chicane. Backs out of it, comes back to the racing line. Yeah, he doesn't want to do 23 laps of Le Mans, an hour and a half of racing and end up making a mistake. And that would be pretty much the end of his race. He wants to 
have a top five finish at the end of the day. And if he just keeps it clean, top five finish will be his. Remember, this is a one-off race, so there is no championship to worry about for these drivers. It's all for pride. Looks to the inside once again, but once again, it's just a peak. And all this is doing is allowing Mittner and Eschhaus to start to pull away bit by bit. Some bobbing and weaving down the straight towards Indianapolis by Setsus trying to break the draft. Clayson rocks up behind him. He's going to run out of opportunities if he doesn't do something soon. Bob's back to the right side. Takes a look down into Indianapolis. Defensive maneuver from Setsus as he goes right to the middle of the track. So with that, we need to go up to Mika Eschhaus. As he comes up to the Porsche curves, started in third place. For him, it's not about if you're the ultimate fastest car, it's if you're the fastest and the cleanest. Everybody around him making mistakes. Mika was not without his, but he held it together. Comes into karting now. He's got a three second lead over Mittner. There's really no worry. He can just back off a little bit to keep it within the bounds of the track to avoid a slowdown. And we'll come back. Apparently there was a wreck in second, but we'll get back to that soon because we've got the finish for our winner. The Dutchman wins in a Dutch one-off race here in a French country. Mika Eshaus takes P1 at Le Mans. A valiant effort from Mittner going from 11th to 2nd. And then third place, am I seeing Grossman? Grossman takes it for the podium. Joseph, you saw the incident. What happened back there? Yeah, I was on board. Uh, Tim Klassens and Sindra Setsas were going side by side, made contact. This is slightly earlier on. Sindra got the bad run and Tim was, well, managed to get the run on him. They're going to go into the Porsche curve side by side. Keep cool. going. You can see them there door to door. That's Sindris in the red and white machine. Grossman in the popcorn position. Brave stuff from these drivers going through the S's. Neither one willing to give. Oh, into bridge. It is like a street course. You just, there's some things you can't get away with through here, Joseph. Yep, and that is one of them. Final lap. All or nothing, we said. There's no championship at stake. Let's watch it from onboard Clayson's view. He wanted to turn in, understandable, and, but yeah, he was just a little bit too far over. Oh, he couldn't get any more forward farther to the right either. Oh, boy. Disappointment for them, but great for Grossman, who gets promoted to the podium from that incident. With that, we're going to take a quick break here on the Global Sim Racing channel. We'll come back with your finishing order as well as driver interviews. But on screen, you're going to see all the upcoming races here on GSRC.
Welcome back to Circuit de la Sarth. We just watched the Gathering of Tweakers 195 Porsche Super Cup. And in the end, it was Mika S. House who took away the win, having started in third on the second row. Great drive by him. How about Michael Mittner, though? Cannot praise this guy enough. Started 11th, used strategy and pace to his advantage to move to second. Simon Grossman may have gotten a little bit lucky. He started in seventh, and then the final lap, when he was in fifth, two cars in front wrecked out. He winds up on the podium. Sindre sets us. Oh, disappointment for him on the pole. He had an issue in his pit entry, the first set of pit stops, and wound up in fourth in the end. He was involved in that incident. So Marcel Fassbender comes home behind him in fifth and David Baraclaw in sixth. Tim Clayson's was the other one involved in that instance with sets us. He didn't get it going as quickly and he finishes in its seventh. Jeremy Ravon, another one with disappointment starting in second and winds up in eighth. Then you've got David Haynes in ninth, who was one of the latest pitters that we saw and still going from 20th to ninth. Another driver using strategy well to his advantage. Dennis Garrison, he gets a top 10. Decent day for him, although he goes one position down from where he started. Darren Seal, another driver way up the order, 29th to 11th. Tom Jansen finishes in 12th today. He is one who was much farther up at the early stages and made a mistake that unfortunately cost him finishing 12th. Boss Slob in 13th with Marco Derricks finishing in 14th. Chris Fuller. We saw issues for him late or later on in the race, finishing in 15th with Lars Moldenauer coming home in 16th and used DeVries in 17th. Casper de Court, he takes P18 with Stefano Regard, the flying smurf, only getting a few spots. He goes from 23rd to 19th. Cedric Boland rounds out our top 20. Then you go to the next graphic and Denny Feller gets the blackjack spot 21st going from 32nd in the field. Good number of positions gained by him. Martin Helligers taking 22nd with Hampus Boz and 23rd Ben Cupers uh, finishes in 24th. One of the drivers who took a very early second stop. Rowan Gill takes 25th today with Anders Christensen coming home in 26. He was ahead of Jason Marichal in 27th. Adam Parle gets P28, and then you've got 29th for Robert DeRui. Jay Yonkers takes home the 30th spot with Kim Cook in 31st. Behind them, 32nd, 33rd, and 34th was Dravgard, Bervin, and Prani, respectively. Then you've got Versluven, Versluven, excuse me, finishing in 35th with Ruth Mulders, coming home behind him in the 36th spot. Bjorn de Forsch goes from 44th to 37th, and Rene Riller comes home in 38th. And a reminder, these cars are all still on the lead lap. That's how many cars, how few cars were lapped in this race. 38th, uh, Rene Veller, 39th, Nenad Ulip, and 40th, Charlie Fruworth. Then we go to the next one. 41st was Andrew Fawcett, with 42nd belonging to Frank Lehman. 43rd was Hans Hasperhoven, with 44th, going to Mark Oros. Just a bad day for him all around. Didn't have a great qualifying. Didn't really have a good showing in the race either. Christian Arp comes home in 45th with Newt Molog in 46th. Then Richard Cortland behind him in 47th, followed by Kip the Hair Flick Stevens in 48th. Davy Du uh, Dehu in 49th and Frank Oosterhaus gets P50. And we get into the cars now that started to have real trouble. Daniel Bardnar, five laps down in 50, 51st. Eric Nannings, 52nd. Patrick Post, 53rd. 11 laps down for Wilhelm Vilberg in 54th. Bob Van Katvik, 55th. Leif Van Genetchen in 56th. Time in Burroughs in 57th. Richard Dennis, 58th. And Christian Skumlian, 59th. Vim Stockman's, sadly today, there's always got to be someone who's last. He gets P60 out of 60 cars starting in this huge, huge field. Let's go to our winner, back to the top of the order, Mika S. House, who we've talked to many times before here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. Mika, you started up with that group. You seem to be kind of one of the guys that wasn't really interested in battling too much. Were you saving fuel uh, with that? Was that part of your strategy of being with that front group? Um, well, yeah. Uh, I should say, um, Tim and me were on TeamSpeak together, so we were communicating and working together. 
Um, but yeah, basically we were, we were just working together that first stint and uh, trying to save as much fuel as possible. Now, starting in third, how good did you think your chances were were to take the win? Uh, because there were so many cars, you had to be aware that it was probably going to be a bit of a, a draft pack up at the front at least, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I didn't even expect to qualify third, to be honest. I thought I'd be somewhere then, like in the pack, in, to, in the top 10. But um, yeah, I was really happy with qualifying third, and then it was just a case of staying up there and not losing the draft. And I believe I'm, I'm correct in assuming you are Dutch, right? Yes. So do you take some uh, pride in, in winning a, a Dutch-hosted race uh, up here for the Gathering of Tweakers? Oh, uh, well, for sure. I hadn't really thought about it yet, but uh, yeah, I've done quite a few guys, uh, quite a few races with these guys, so yeah, definitely. Well, you put on a great show with us, with, uh, uh, with your teammate there, and uh, we appreciate you coming and talk to us and hope to see you next time we get to week 13. Yeah, thank you guys, hopefully. See you. That was Mika S. House, our winner today. I believe we have second place Michael Mittner to talk to us, who we really want to know what his pitch strategy was because it certainly seemed to work wonders. Michael, did you did it worry you at all that so many of the leaders around you were doing a, a, a different pitch strategy? Did you start to question yourself at any point? Uh, well, that was my only chance with a different pitch strategy that I can get up to the podium. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it worked really well, I have to say. Started P11 and finishing on the podium is, podium is beyond my expectations. Well, it worked beautifully. Did you do a lot of work in the pre-race and practice trying to do fuel stints and try and figure out what was the quickest way, or was that more of a wing and a prayer on your strategy? Well, uh, uh, I practiced a lot and yeah, had good pace, but my qualifying today was not good. And then, yeah, after the after the start, shortly before the first stop, I was behind Simon, and um, I said to myself, "Okay, I will try something now with the pit strategy to jump him into pits." So I only took 50 liters instead of 60, and yeah, it worked. I I came out right in front of him from the pit, and then it was just uh, driving consistent and driving fast. Well, this combination of the the Porsche and the uh, of Le Mans seems to suit you very well. But if you were forced to pick a different combination for the next week 13, what would you like to see for the gathering of tweakers race? Well, maybe the Nordschleife. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's fun. Yeah, not Nordschleife. All yes. right. I am, I'm with you on that one. That tends to put on entertaining stuff for, here on the broadcast booth as well. Congratulations on a second place and beautiful job out on track. Thank you. Thank you for broadcasting. As Michael Mittner, second place on the podium here. Now, we also have Simon Grossman. Yes, we do. He was the bottom step of the podium. Probably didn't expect to be there. Simon, you had your own bit of troubles on this race, but it, it worked out in your favor in the end. Yeah, I didn't expect to be on the podium, to be honest. I saw Sindra and Tim fighting really hard in the end, and I thought maybe they could crash out, but I didn't expect to, and it's certainly not the way I wanted to be on the podium. Now, uh, obviously, there's a, I see a polar bear on the side of your car. Are you part of Team Glacier? Am I seeing that correctly? No, no, it's Trinity Motorsports. Ah, okay, there we go. So, uh, obviously, you have a lot of involvement with, with iRacing outside of just the racing aspect. You've developed ATVO, with, which a lot of broadcasters seem to appreciate, uh, ours included. What inspired you to, to create that? It started back in 2014, um, to be honest. Um, we founded a team and then we wanted to create an, uh, an own, uh, own racing series and we wanted uh, an own overlay with custom animations and all that. And yeah, that's how it, how it started. And then, yeah, later Nick joined the team and then we developed a team editor and that's now the product you see today. Well, it is a fantastic product. We very much enjoy it and are uh, uh, enjoying the fruits of your labor. One last question before I let you go. What is the meaning of Camber Joe? Uh, basically a joke from a German uh, YouTuber called uh, Jean-Pierre Kremer. Um, he called a car which had, he called a car Camber Joe, which had like four or five degrees camber on the, on the rear wheels. <laughs>
That's wow. It. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming and talking to us, and great job on that podium finish. Thank you. That was Simon Grossman. And we've got one more to talk to. Might not be quite as happy as Simon. Sindre sets us. And Sindre, uh, you started on the pole and you looked very strong. Was it embarrassing on your pit entry? I mean, did you feel like you threw the race away at that moment? Um, I, I was definitely the quickest car on track today. So if it, yeah, I think I could have got away with it if it wasn't for that. Uh, I hadn't unchecked my tires as well, so I uh, took one tire, which made the car horrible, and I lost like five, six seconds. So I think I could have won without either the spin or the tire change, but yeah. Talk to us about the incident on the final lap going through uh, the Porsche curves. You and Tim Clayson's got together. What's your opinion on what happened? Um, he has the preferred line going into the corner. He doesn't clear me. Um, then I have the preferred line for the next left hander. Um, and he, well, he, he is on the outside. He's not going to get any positions from staying on the outside. He might as well, he could have might as well just backed off because he was never going to get that position because it's a double left hander. Um, yeah, there was maybe an inch or two that he could have used as well. He, he's also sideways, uh, as he hits me. So, yeah. Uh, I can tell the disappointment on your voice. So we've got 12 weeks to think about this one. I guess 13, depending on when the race is, are you going to come back for the next gathering of tweakers event and, and try to redeem yourself with a win? Uh, if it's not like this, like a draft train where you basically only need to be within one and a half uh, seconds of uh, the quickest guy to just stay within the draft and save fuel, then probably, yeah. Uh, I'd like to see heat racing on a road. That would be fun without fuel saving like this. So. Ah, heat racing on the pavement would certainly be interesting. Well, commiserations, and we do hope to see you back next time. All right, thanks. That's all we have time for. That was uh, Sindra Setsas coming home in fourth. And of course, we want to thank a few people before we close up. Of course, a huge thank you to the Gathering of Tweakers for organizing this event. It's a lot bigger undertaking than people realize trying to pull this all together. And they did a fantastic job. There was great racing all around. We have a lot of cars that finish this race, which is no mean feat with 60 of them out on track. Thanks to the companies that provide the software and hardware for our broadcast listed here on your screen. Additional thanks go out to Eric Eckholm and Casey Lalonde who provide our wonderful music. See the screen for how to get hold more of their great work. Thanks to the team today, Joseph, Amjad, and Ducky. If you'd like to find out more about GSRC, including upcoming races, you can find it at globalsimracingchannel.com or you can check out us uh, check us out on social media. We're on Twitter at GSR Channel. We're on Facebook at slash global sim racing channel we also have instagram now that's new for us it is gsrc underscore gram and above all don't forget we need you to subscribe to see all of our videos so that they show up in your feed so go over and hit that subscribe button now while you've got the opportunity we have upcoming races for other series listed on the screen so check those out and mark them down on your calendar however until next time race clean race hard and we'll see you on the track <laughs>